going to, um, we'd like to start by um, introducing Paul McGarry. So Paul McGarry is the director of uh, Greater Manchester Ageing Hub. Uh, he has a long and illustrious career um, in, in ageing work in Greater Manchester and is a big champion of creative ageing. He's also, he's an honorary research fellow at the University of Manchester and he has also been a member of the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities. Um, so I will pass over to Paul to talk to us a little bit about his perspective on this area of work. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> that, uh, thanks, Julie. It's lovely to see so many people joining us uh, uh, this afternoon and uh, so many familiar uh, names and faces. Um, as, uh, as Julie mentioned, I, I work for the Combined Authority, so I'm kind of uh, one of, if not the only bureaucrat in the in this particular room, but one, a bureaucrat that's absolutely committed to this agenda. And um, and I often say it's one of the, uh, it, it, it's the most interesting and enjoyable part of my job um, because, uh, you know, working alongside colleagues in, in the creative and cultural sector is, uh, and this is a good thing, is unlike anything else I do in my job. Um, and actually, I did. I have. I'm that committed that first of all, I got some IT prints be, uh, behind me um, to to make sure I didn't feel left out. But I'm also that committed that I've, I've been out to for the last two nights um, to cultural uh, venues. Last night to see a 77 year old jazz rock drummer, and the night before to see a 74 year old uh, lead singer and flautist in a, from a 1970s progressive rock band. And if you can spot who they are, there's a special prize at the end of the uh, at the end of the the session. So look, I, I, I'll show, get on with things. Okay. So you know, aging is um, it's a it's a universal thing. If we're lucky, we all get old, you know. Uh, and there's a there's a there's a famous quote which goes something like, "Everybody wants to get old, but nobody wants to be old," you know. And um, in public policy and and and, uh, and public debate, aging or our aging society is not really, other than some bits around social care, sometimes sometimes about generational fairness. There isn't a huge amount talked about it. Uh, and uh, you know the three party conferences that we uh, well the tour is in in Manchester next week. Although I am speaking at a fringe meeting, which you can come to. There's very little discussion about the aging population and the fundamental, let's be under no illusions, the fundamental change which is going on around us in terms of the age profile of the places that we live in, the services that we use, the relationships that we have, the, fam the shape of our families, all this is changing at pace and will continue to change at pace over the next generation, you know. And um, if you want to kind of have a peer to the future, have a look at what's going on in Japan and, and, and South Korea and places like that, where the population has aged incredibly quickly uh, for various reasons. Uh, and the aging world is, is, is uh, so my work, I guess, really is, uh, as, a, as I say, as a kind of bureaucrat, is trying to answer the question, you know, how are our public organisations uh, on a private organisation, as individuals or communities going to respond to this question of population aging? How do we push it up the agenda? How do we get people to think about it in a way that isn't just thinking about older people now, although that's an absolutely critical issue? I think the other thing that's really interesting, I was in a me meeting yesterday with some huge investors uh, from the private sector, uh, and I think what's happened over the last decade is that the big corporate organisations, every corporate organisation, every um, uh, every organisation you, you can think about now, from McDonald's to Apple, all the people that make things that are in your home have programmes thinking about ageing, preparing for ageing populations, creating new products. I was in a meeting yesterday where investors were telling me there are tens of billions of pounds uh, in investment funds looking for opportunities around ageing, particularly around things like housing and so on. And it seems to me that we're in a position where 
um, non-state players, so some of the big investment uh, investors and others, are now making the running to a large extent because of this vacuum that we've created in public policy around energy. Okay, that's the big macro kind of picture. In, in Greater Manchester, we have the Greater Manchester Aging Hub, which is a team inside the combined authority, which brings together researchers and uh, frontline staff, and people like me, uh, uh, older people's organisations and others to try and implement this World Health Organisation age-friendly cities and communities model. And we have programmes around housing, employment, digital inclusion, placemaking, and so on and so forth. And one of the projects that I've worked on, I don't know, it's nearly 20 years now, is around creativity and culture and ageing. Probably had some of our first big scale events in 2004, 2005 in the city of Manchester uh, with uh, a small number at that point of arts organisations, cultural organisations. And through the last, uh, the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we've built up capacity expertise uh, and we've transformed people's lives. You know, there's nothing more powerful than the testimony of residents and citizens of the city region explaining to a packed room how being involved in one of the projects that we've designed and got money for has, has transformed their lives and how they see themselves once they've retired. And I, I, it has a huge impact on people's participants as volunteers, as audience members. And I think it's um, it also gives us the opportunity to transform how we see older people and how we see ageing as well. I'm just going to move on to a, another point, really, which is it's not just about transforming people's lives. There is something called the longevity dividend. There's the economic case for doing more work with older people. Um, we commissioned a report two years ago from the International Longevity Centre called Advantage Greater Manchester. And what they discovered is that the combined, this is two or three years ago, the combined spending power of Greater Manchester's households aged 65 and over is increasing by £280 million pounds each year. £280 million. Pounds. Uh, and GM uh, 65 plus households are currently saving £1.8 billion pounds each year that could be spent within the local economy. OK, so there's a big argument here for doing more uh, in, our, in our cultural sector to, to attract older people uh, and ageing populations, particularly those marginalised groups and those least likely to, uh, to take advantage of this, uh, these wonderful things that we have. I'm just going to finish on a couple of points and then I'll, I'll shut up. So the first one is where we are now. Now, I, I can't start to imagine the profound difficulties that colleagues in the cultural and creative sector have faced over the last 18 months. You know, it's not a sector I'm part of. It's not a sector I work in, really. But, you know, uh, you can't ignore the huge strains that have been on organisations and individuals. Um, we also know, for example, in terms of older people, that the numbers of older people using public transport is anything between 25 and 30 percent less than it was pre-pandemic. We also know from some research, uh, I think recently published, that something like 50 percent of older people are telling us that they don't want to go back to cultural activities because they they don't feel safe or it's something they've got out of the habit of doing and so on. And we also know there's been a profound impact on uh, excess volunteers or people volunteering to take part. So we've got a huge challenge in front of us. And I think for me, the first step in this challenge is, um, uh, is we need to work together and we need to work with groups of older people who can tell us uh, how we design uh, the places and spaces and the things that they want to do and find new ways of doing that. And we've got Elaine and Eggboo today who's on the call from the Greater Manchester Older People's Network and the Age Friendly Manchester Board. I think working together with groups of older people is the start of all uh, uh, knowledge in this. I think uh, we have to reassess this idea of the longevity dividend, the economic, the economics of it, as well as the 
for me, the, the primary role as culture and creativity as something which makes life worth living. As I was dancing around to Jeff Rogg's all the night before last. And um, the last thing I just want to say is, uh, is I want everybody, I guess, uh, to join in this vision, this ambition to create better lives for all of us, because we're, if we're lucky, we're all going to get old. And the things that we do now, the things that we put in place for an age friendly city region uh, will pay dividends over decades. So let's um, let's get on with it. And I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to stop highlighting you. Uh, keep smiling for a second. Okay. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning, of course, that if you have any questions, there will be a couple of brief moments for asking questions directly. If you'd like to put your question uh, in the chat, then we or or put your hand up uh, when I when I ask if there are any questions. That'd be great. But if you could put questions in the chat, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I think that tension, but also the opportunities between the between the the kind of the the, the benefits, the well-being benefits, the mental health benefits, the physical benefits of culture and creativity and participating and creating um, cultural content when you're an older person. Um, that balanced with the huge economic opportunity, which I think at the moment is being largely missed. Um, by the culture sector is um, it's a really interesting relationship and it's something that I know that we're going to be looking at in the future. So thank you. I'm going to move very quickly on to Elaine um, Enegba, who luckily Paul has already introduced really. So she's part of the Greater Manchester Older People's Network and the Age Friendly Manchester Board. Elaine is a huge champion for this area of work and has also been involved in uh, the Culture Champions programme from its very inception. And as part of Great Place, what we've been able to do is extend that programme so that there are five, there have been five localities, five districts that have had culture champions uh, programmes happening in them. Um, so um, I, I'm really, really pleased to um, welcome Elaine, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the importance of the culture champions programme. And then after that, we're going to hear more specifically about one of the culture champions programmes in Stratford, uh, Stratford in Trafford. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for inviting me. I've been asked to speak about the Culture Champions Programme. The Culture Champions Programme started in October 2011 in response to older people. Uh, their perception was that cultural organizations was not for them. Culture champions are older people who are ambassadors for the arts and culture sector. This is a flagship program which has, been which has achieved local, national and international recognition and has also inspired uh, study visits from countries worldwide. Culture champions are active participants, and I have seen and experienced the fantastic, it's fantastic prog progression. They have fostered links with their communities and networks, and they have maximized the reach of arts and culture to the forum of older people, and also helping to bridge the information gap. They're, they're also involved in activities that stimulate. They have a platform to enhance their skills and older people have pushed boundaries with the Royal Exchange Elders Theatre, creating their own styles and theme plays and they sit in the artistic division of the Royal Exchange Theatre and this enables their performances to reach much wider audiences. Culture Champions has also participated in European Arts Project, where a piece of music was composed with Culture Champions and led by the Camerata uh, Orchestra. Then it's music by director and musicians. This piece of 
work that was produced was now sent to uh, Germany, where it was choreographed and all the people performed this at the European Arts Conference in Brussels. There are so many more examples of participation. During COVID, all the people were required to isolate. This heightened anxiety, fear, suspicions, and mistrust. They were socially isolated, we were lonely, we became depressed, and some even developed problems of mobility. Opportunities for engagement were significantly reduced, and for some, often no engagement at all. These were challenging times, and more so, with great numbers of older people not being digitally connected. I would like to mention two examples of innovative, innovative projects, which connected older people, and this was in Wivenshaw and Path of Trafford, and it was the String of Hearts, a community uh, arts organization. And I became aware of this as a culture champion. And this community delivered workshops via the digital platform. The lockdown song of this digital platform was produced and televised on ITV, reaching over 1 million people. And for those that are not on the digital platform, a hotline was created via free friendly phone calls, professional musicians, uh, we compose music based on the personal experiences of the older people they contacted. And what happened now, later this month, an album would be released from that project called The Spotlights. This shines a light on creativity, no matter the age, the background or experience. And all the people during the lockdown were also digitally connected to the Manchester Museum and discussed objects, learned about it, and we also had dancing exercise. The great thing is that the evaluation of this, uh, of the Culture Champions project, was supported by the Manchester University Collaborative Research and Aging and also with Keel University. Now, benefits that champions uh, uh, got from this program, you know, it severely minimized isolation and loneliness, and it also improved our health and well-being. It enabled champions to reach our communities in a very meaningful way. We felt valued, we felt confident, we felt connected, we felt inspired and informed. We also had curator-guided tours and at times benefited from discounts um, to events. I would like to mention a few quotes from older people who were involved in the cultural sector. I no longer have to sit and look at the four walls. I felt as if my world was shrinking. My confidence is boosted now and I feel valued and inspired. I felt as if I was a nobody and now people are learning from me. It also gave chance, give me chance, one artist said, to recover my artistry. And this was an 89 year old person who had BA and MA in fine arts. There are yet things to be done. We need to have relationships cultivated with the care sector, the care home sector. Information should be accessible in different forms, and also it should include information on the nearest bus or tram stops, the drop-off zones that you have, the nearby parking and its costs, and we need to develop closer link with the ethnic minority communities. There have to be embedded policies into organizations working practice, and we need to develop inter intergenerational um, connections. It shows that culture partners can play their part in helping me and other older people to connect to the places we so love. 
The relationship should be strengthened to support recovery together. We need to continue to explore and maximize the reach of cultural champions across Greater Manchester and find new ways to widen participation, recognizing the value and the contributions that all the people bring to our city region and make Manchester a fantastic place to grow older. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Elaine, for that. Um, it's really, always really inspiring to hear you speak. Um, if you have any questions for Paul or Elaine and you'd like to put those in the chat, um, we'll be able to come to some questions after our next uh, double act from um, Stretford Public Hall. Um, I'm going to move straight on to, to that and then we'll have a little moment for, um, for a bit of reflection. So apologies to uh, Jess and Kate, you've got to follow Elaine, <laughs> but <laughs> somebody has to. So I'm going to introduce now um, uh, Kate McGeever and uh, Jess, sorry Jess, your surname has just gone out of my head. I'm stumbling on the words. Okay. Um, so um, Jess Loveday, sorry. Uh, we're going to talk about the experience of um, culture champions in Stratford Public Hall. So uh, Jess is a freelance uh, artist and she was the project manager of culture champions. Um, she has uh, a, a, a fairly long career in working in um, participation and engagement. And um, she did an absolutely amazing job actually running um, running the Culture Champions in Stratford. And Kate McGeever is the director of um, Stratford Public Hall, which is quite a young uh, organisation. And um, they're going to um, do a presentation together to tell you about the, the work that they did and the impact that that had both on the older people that they were working with, but also on the hall itself. So I will... Um, hand over to you. Uh, which one of you is going to be speaking first so I can spotlight the right one? I'm going to speak first but I think Claire has got the presentation because I wasn't able to do it. On okay. The Mac and yeah. team don't like each other. Yeah okay so Claire if you want to um, share um, Jess's pub um, presentation that would be great. Okay right take it away Jess and I'm so sorry your name your surname went out of my head. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Claire. Yeah, so just on to the, um, the next slide. It's fine. Thank you. Yeah, so as Julie said, uh, I was a project manager for Culture Champions. It was based in, in Trafford. Um, so it started in September 2019 and ran until March this year. So obviously we had the pandemic during most of the most of the project, which was very challenging, but we still were able to deliver most of what we'd what we'd set out to do. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, Elaine has uh, kind of illustrated a really amazing picture of Culture Champions as as a whole program, and as she said, started in two thousand and eleven. Um, so it's been running for a long time. It's had. Uh, uh, it's evolved a lot so I guess um, the Trafford project was one of the one of like the latest versions of that which really had a focus on um, on working with people to deliver to program and deliver their own uh, projects and events and activities uh, next slide please um, so I'm not going to talk about the projects them, themselves but I'm just going to talk more about how the programme itself was able to support so many amazing projects. So first of all, the, the definition of culture and creativity was, was really flexible in this and we allowed people to decide what that meant for them. We didn't come in with a preconceived idea of, of what, what that is or our personal experience of, of what that is. So we allowed people to, de to define it in, in the way that they felt um, aligned with, with their interests and their, um, their passions and their loves. Um, so because of that, there was a, the projects are really, really varied. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and they were they were just re they were really diverse, and I think opening up the the idea of what culture can be and what it means to people allowed this to really happen. And um, the second point was that it was really person centred. So everyone that delivered a project 
it really started with meeting with people, having a brew, having a chat, and just gauging where they were, where they were with their um, with their project idea. So there were some people that had uh, really fully formed ideas of what they wanted to do, a really clear vision, and there were other people that had more of a a seed of idea, seed of an idea. There there was one woman that had had an idea years years ago and just didn't really know how to you know how to make that happen the steps um to like produce a project i guess but this the variation in the experiences of people that were involved uh allowed me to really work one-to-one -one with people that needed it and work more directly with them to respond to um to their needs and and their goals really and what they wanted to achieve within that so yeah just making it really pe person-centered and being able to adapt the offer um per person was uh, just a really amazing part of the project which contributed to the success and then the final point is that the there was micro grants that were offered um, so we all know that money speaks and it allows people to deliver projects to to a high standard but it, I think it also it also really shows value in what someone is offering of their their idea and their concept and it really uh, <clears throat> proves that it's that it's needed in the community and it, it kind of gives weight to it um so being able to offer obviously financially for it to be able to happen but having having money to to show to show value and um and that you trust someone to do something as well and that you 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 can have a shared vision within that makes people feel really empowered um and have like a you know strong connection into what they want to do um next slide please and this is just some of the projects here. And then next slide. And then I'm going to pass on to Kate, who's going to speak more about the, the kind of longer term uh, uh, benefits of Culture Champions and that it's had on the organisation. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. That was great. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just going to say a bit about how uh, the, the Trafford Culture Champions project impacted on us at, at Stratford Public Hall and the kind of impact it's had on our arts programming um, at, since it's since it's completed. Um, and I guess it's worth just sort of just saying a bit about the hall. So, um, as Julie said, we're a young organisation. We formed in uh, 2015 as a volunteer led organisation um, and have had a staff team in place since 2018. So, uh, and, and, and only a small team of staff, so um, three, three uh, permanent staff, I think, when we first started on the, the Culture Champions project. Um, and what that meant is that I think we, we although we're very much a community um, run building and a community led organisation, we really hadn't had the time to um, develop our arts programme the way that, that we would have liked. Um, so the activities that we ran tended to be um, programmed by staff, programmed by our board, um, informed by the, the work in our of our tenants in our artist studios, all of whom are quite young. Uh, and I think that meant that you know, without really sort of realising we the, the activities that we ran tended to be focused on quite a narrow demographic. Um, so if we just go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, we ran cinema nights, art, uh, art exhibitions, art classes, live music nights, but all, all focused on quite a narrow, narrow de demographic. Um, and I think what Culture Champions has really meant is that is, it's really informed a shift to a much more of a resident-led programming um, and a real focus on the artists and, and local artists kind of guiding the work that we're doing. Um, so just the next slides, please. Julie, I think you need to spotlight Claire for the presentation to come up because it's just um, Kate's face at the moment. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to say just two two projects that have very um, directly been informed by Culture Champions. So the first is a, is an arts council project called Elevate, which which Jess delivered, um, and it set out to engage with residents from um, um, Black, Asian, and other ethnic groups, which have previously been underrepresented at the hall. And although not not directly aimed at older people, the project very much adopted the kind of artist led um, approach of Culture Champions, and it was a, a really successful project. Um, and then next slide. Uh, and then the second, this is a project called Thriving Communities Trafford. Uh, it's jointly funded by the Arts Council and the National Academy for Social Prescribing. Uh, it's a much longer project. It's year long. We're, we're still in the middle of it. Um, 
and it's involving eight local community groups with different groups of residents uh, and the groups are working with different groups of residents to design community activities. So at the hall, we're working with um, a group of carers to understand the challenges of being a carer and, and how that impacts on the ability of uh, carers to kind of engage with cultural activities and, and, and um, leisure activities. And so we're exploring the types of activities that we could um, offer at the hall that would offer respite to carers. Um, I was also going to talk at, at this point about the brilliant work that String of Hearts are doing, but um, I'm pleased that Elaine has already uh, told you about them, and I think Lucy's on, on in this meeting as well. Um, so String of Hearts are working with um, residents that have been recently bereaved and looking at how music making activities can bring people together and build confidence. So all of the projects within thriving communities, all of these eight different projects um, are involving local residents there through facilitated design led workshops and they're designing their own cultural and arts based activities. So very much informed by um, all of the work that Jess did and, the, and the, 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 um, we learned from the from the culture champions we were lucky to work with uh, in Trafford. And then finally, Next slide. Um, and I think for us, the project success really reinforced our um, commitment to community led activities and, and, and proved the value of having staff dedicated to this. Um, I think the, the, the time and, and the, the sort of space that Jess had to, to really build relationships and build that trust, I think, as she's been saying, um, was really, really valuable in, in, in the, for the project and something we're keen to kind of commit to. So we've managed to secure funding. Um, for a full time community coordinator who's continuing to work with residents and, and to build on the lessons from culture champions. And one very direct impact is that we've set up a, um, a community panel made up of local residents of all ages um, to decide on the activities and events that we run at the hall. Um, and, and our new member of staff that's that the sort of coordinator is going to be working with um, residents to, to develop their ideas and to really um, ensure that all of our activities at Hall are being designed and, and, and led by um, local artists of all ages. Um, so it's been a brilliant project for us. We were really um, pleased to be part of it and um, yeah, pleased to be here today to talk about it. So thanks to Julie and GMCA. Thank you um, very much, both of you. Um, I'm going to well have time for a question or two in a minute. Um, what I'm going to do uh, now is I'm just going to play you a very short film. Um, Sarah, one of the organisers of Pink Purse, um, which, which was one of the Culture Champions projects at Stratford Public Hall, just to give you a flavour of the kind of things that, um, that we did. So bear with me for a second while I get this working. Uh, And thanks very much for agreeing to take part recording um, some um, answers to a few questions about Pink Purse and Stratford Culture Champions. So if you'd just like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Pink Purse and how you got involved. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Sarah Wilkinson. Um, I live in Trafford um, and uh, many years ago, 20 years ago, as part of a group of women who at the time did a lesbian and gay um, cabaret night at what was the green room um, in town and it was um it was always quite quirky a bit of a oh no types of acts some good some terrible very much a kind of community event um and that was the joy of it really it was a right old mixed bag of things um and we have been thinking oh it's 20 years since we've done it now and we're all a bit older and it would be great to do something and make it more inclusive by making it LGBT um, and we saw the culture champions uh, opportunity really and thought oh this might be a great way to put our toe in the water again about getting organised and putting on an event that would appeal to the generation of people who went 20 years ago to the first pink purses. Um, why do you think it's important to, apart from your obviously your personal passion for the event, why would you think it's important to, to reactivate that event? What's the importance of LGBT, old, older people and culture? What's, what's it, why, why are you feel so passionate about it? I think um, LGBT culture is often seen as a young culture and, and there's often a, a sort of focus on bars and clubbing and it doesn't feel um, particularly inclusive to older people always, the LGBT culture. Um, although that's improving and there are a lot of other LGBT older people's projects around, I know, but um, it feels like the kind of 
more of the sort of fun side of LGBT culture is often aimed at younger people. Um, and I think as we all get older, people tend to lose connections with that sense of community of being part of that LGBT community. Um, and often people settle down and disappear off the scene and uh, not and that doesn't kind of suit everybody. And it, it just felt like um, people do tend to kind of just get on with their lives and not necessarily come together and celebrate in the way that we used to. So we wanted to be able to do that. I know that you had to um, put the event online uh, because of yeah. COVID, um, but even so, you still had a great attendance at the at the event that you did. Can you give us a bit of a flavour of the audience response and the kind of you know, the kind of reaction you got to the event from the people that came along? Yeah, it was a bit of a roller coaster of um, of rearrangements because we, we we were due to have it on something like March the I think it was March the twenty third or something last year. It was literally the week after lockdown started, so we were ready to go. We'd made the decorations for Stretford Public Hall, and we got all the travel arrangements for everybody. It was all literally ready to go, and then we decided to cancel it. Um, and then we rescheduled it. Um, it took quite a long time because of the changing restrictions. So we uh, it took quite a long time. And in the end, we did it in November um, of last year. And again, the restrictions changed. We thought we were going to be able to um, do it in Stretford Public Hall. Um, or maybe it was December. Anyway, we thought we were going to be able to do it in Stretford Public Hall and film it, but we couldn't because the, the next lockdown came. So we literally had to do it from people's bedrooms. We had fantastic um, technical support from the public hall and from the people they brought in to help with that. So in some ways that was quite difficult to gauge, but we, we kind of streamed it on um, Facebook and we streamed it on YouTube as well. And so we were able to see the feedback that people gave in the comments. And also part of the event is, is very much kind of blurring that line between who, who, who's an audience member and who's a performer. So we had um, a, a couple of people went out and did little interviews with people, doorstep interviews with people, and that was great. People who had been to it 20 years ago. So that became part of what was shown during the event. So that actually brought people um, into the event, see themselves being interviewed. Um, and we got great kind of feedback in the chat. Um, not everything's to everybody's taste, but that's part of what a cabaret is. Um, but generally, I think people were very positive and found it just a really good experience after having so long, you know, even more isolated that we weren't anticipating, you know, that, that people would be just an opportunity to come together um, and even if it's online and have something to talk about, have something different to talk about and engage with. I think it was really positive for people. And what what have you, final question to ask you, what have you kind of, what, what, have you, what person have you taken from it and is there anything you'd like to do going forward? Yeah, personally, I think um, it, it sort of reconnected me back into the, that community, which was great, that community of older LGBT people. Um, and also um, was a really nice working again with a, a new organisation, working with Stretford Public Hall and thinking about the possibilities and potential. And we have, um, just by coincidence, we have uh, just been talking to them about whether to do a in-person pink purse at some point in the future. So watch this space. We'd very much like to um, use the, you know, the new renovated ballroom and put something on in person in the future. OK, um, thank you so much, Sarah, for, um, for giving us a bit of a flavour of the event. Um, it's thank been you. really interesting. And if anyone wants to follow us, we've got a Facebook group. So just look, look for Pink Purse and you can follow us on Facebook. I'll put the link in the chat. OK, thanks, Julie. Bye. OK. Uh... OK. Um... Great. So that gives you a bit of a flavour of the event. So has anyone got any questions about culture champions or anything they want to say or anything they want to ask at this point before we move on to start talking about another project? Um, I can't see any hands up anywhere. Um, if you haven't, we can save them to the end. We've got a little bit of space at the end. Um, OK, we'll move. We'll um, we'll move on then. So we um, we're going to talk now um, a little bit about the Boulder project, a slightly different emphasis, a slightly different project. Uh, we were 
Boulder was um, an idea that came about when we started to think about older artists and professional artists. Um, I won't say too much about it because I know Maya and Helen are going to are going to talk about it. Uh, but it was it was looking at about about the professionalization and the continued professional development for artists over the age of 50 and we we found out very quickly from our research that there was very very little available so as well as looking at culture challenges and opportunities for participation and producing in a kind of community context we also wanted to look at where the, where older artists were in sort of the professional creative landscape so um, I'll introduce, first of all, uh, Maya Chowdhury. So Maya is an interactive artist and a theatre maker uh, and writer. And um, she's worked um, on, in radio, film, live art and theatre. And um, her current practice uses interactive theatre making and digital storytelling to create immersive and dem democratic experiences for audiences. So Maya, I um, will pass the spotlight on to you. Um, you have some slides and we're, we're all cheering for you that they're gonna, it's going to work fine. So yeah, let's uh, see if it perfect. works. Right, play from start. Can you see the slide? Yes. Great. OK, so uh, this is me on a project in Fleetwood called Wire Salters uh, making salt um, from seawater. Um, so what I wanted to um, talk about then is um, a few things about Boulder. So I would say one of the main impacts from Boulder was the recognition by Castlefield Gallery that I was an artist that they were interested in working with. Um, there were 10 artists on the scheme and Helen is going to talk a little bit more about it in, in detail. Um, so I was very happy to be successful. Um, and um, I had tried 10 times in the last year for various residencies and commissions. And I was starting to think that maybe my art wasn't relevant, maybe my ideas were out of date. Um, and of course, you never get any feedback when you apply, um, as this letter shows you. There were 400 people who applied for this fellowship. So you never know if it's to do with your idea. Have you had a bad idea? Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it is, in fact, age and they wanted a younger artist. So during the scheme, um, we went on a lot of different workshops. We had one to ones uh, with the gallery, with Helen and also um, with the curator in the gallery. And one of the main things that came out for me was um, confidence in the art that I was making, in my ideas, and it helped me to reorient myself with where I wanted to go. It gave me and it also renewed a set of skills to help me to get there. So in essence, Boulder gave me a reset of what I needed to be a freelance artist in 2020. So um, as part of old Boulder, um, I've been in three group exhibitions. One was online, one was in Castlefield Gallery, which is the image that you're seeing here, and one was uh, a pop-up exhibition that is still um, on in Wigan. And this is a big uh, deal in terms of exhibiting as an artist, but also uh, during the last year, the arts, as you as you all know, have been impacted um, by COVID. So a lot of exhibitions have been cancelled and have not been rescheduled. I was also selected by the British Council as one of the artists for an international digital residency and the types of um, kind of uh, workshops and kind of skills development all kind of helped with um, just kind of uh, improving my skills in these areas. So this is um, a, an image from our um, exhibition in Wigan. So uh, Sabrina, who was also on Boulder and myself, um, have made a sound walk, which is called Those Who Were There, which is about the music scene in Wigan. Um, and you kind of go around the city um, experiencing those sounds. So I feel that Boulder and all the kind of publicity around it, um, the group exhibition as well, um, are all working towards countering um, society's attitudes about older artists and the type of work that they make. Um, Obstructions was a collaboration 
um, between the graduate students and us. But at the end of the day, what the what the audience saw was art, not age. I also think it's important to be intersectional when thinking about these programmes um, and including artists, older artists in the cultural sector. Um, as a person of colour artist and a lesbian, there are many ways that I can feel excluded from being included. So I have to go back and stop sharing. Hmm, where's my window gone? <laughs> Here it is. Right, hopefully I'm stopping sharing the, the screen now. Have I stopped sharing? Yeah, great. OK, that's me. So over to you now, Helen. Hello. I don't know if uh, I, I'm, I needed to be in a spotlight, Julie. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me or not. Done. <laughs> OK, well, thanks for inviting me to say a few words about Boulder today. Julie, you actually asked um, in some notes that you sent over to us to prepare for today a very specific question. Um, so I'll try and just uh, kind of talk about our journey and the programme and the gallery um, through the lens of that question. It will make sense, I hope, when I finish. But Julie's question was, how supporting older artists has contributed to a new understanding of the role of older people in a contemporary visual arts organisation, um, which is what Castlefield Gallery is. <laughs> so we're, just, to, just to give you a bit of context, so we're an art gallery, um, a contemporary art gallery. We're nestled just behind Deansgate train station. We've been operating in the city of Manchester since 1984. Um, we did have another home initially on Deansgate, uh, but we're also an artist development organisation as well. We used to be, an, we used to call that an agency, but I think just saying we're an artist development organisation makes much more sense. We also um, uh, run um, off spaces, you might call them, so like pop up new art spaces around Greater Manchester and the Northwest. Um, I was showing some images um, of uh, around our Wigan space, weren't you, just then? Um, so when I first started in 2017, I was looking at our audience data quite closely. And um, whilst I was aware that, say, for example, in terms of our associate membership, so we have associate artists, there are about 240 of them at the moment, mostly in Manchester and Greater Manchester. Um, the, 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 we were generally fairly representational um, with regards to age within our program. We, we definitely had a big gap with regards to audience. Um, we, the gallery's kind of known for being a bit uh, on the edge, uh, attracting the zeitgeist and um, uh, very busy with uh, a lot of young new graduates coming out of some of the, 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 two, some of the art schools um, in the city region. And so I really wanted to shift that a little bit and find some balance. So we started to look at how to do that through the programme. So by how to signal, um, like Maya said, a different kind of perspective, a, a different image, a bit of image making around um, older people to counteract uh, some of the dominant images that we see coming out of um, kind of mainstream press media, but also even with the, the arts and cultural sector itself. Um, so we we commissioned, a, we developed a co-commission with a, a large number of partners um, and invited two artists, um, Ben White and Eileen Simpson, who form Open Music Archive, to develop a a large scale commission, pu uh, public performance, quite, quite a dynamic project, it took about two years. It was, a, it was a really big program. And what we didn't know would happen is that, that because of their process and their interests, we ended up working, um, they asked us to invite, we ended up working with 10 or more um, musicians who were all kind of in their 60s, 70s, 80s. I think one of them was uh, nearly 90. Um, from across Greater Manchester, bringing them and the artists together to make this new wonderful film piece. And there were loads of unexpected outcomes that came out of that that we hadn't anticipated. 
some more obvious kind of um, social impact, uh, things like feeling reconnected, um, kind of uh, moving on from feeling isolated, forming new friendships, etc. But loads that came from that group about, you know, the feelings that, you know, we are still creatives, even though we've not performed maybe for 20 years. Um, we have value. Our work has value. Our creativity has value and really enjoyed having what they felt like was actually a professional experience once again later in life. So when Julie approached us about, you know, the question, well, what could we do with artists um, who are over 50 who might um, uh, be looking for different opportunities, particularly in terms of continual professional development, um, you know, what could we do? I started to think about the fact that we have some really targeted artist development programs and that we really maybe weren't considering age in the context of those. So long story short, <laughs> um, between a lot of conversation between Julie I and some of my team, um, uh, Boulder was born, essentially. Um, and we've now run two iterations of Boulder. So we've had two cohorts, that's 20 um, artists, uh, professional artists, from across Greater Manchester, working with us over about 18, to, 18 months to two, two years. And in the middle of that, yes, we also had obstructions, which uh, Julie um, supported us with, which was an exhibition that brought uh, a, to, uh, a, how many were there of you? My, I think it was about 17 of you or so, um, artists from two very distinct generations together to develop this exhibition together in the, in the lockdown last year. Um, so I'm just trying to find my notes here. Um, I think there's been a lot of learning through the process, um, definitely for ourselves in terms of understanding the need and demand and what the reasons are for those that need and demand. And they've been really va varying. Um, people looking for second careers, people who were already on a career trajectory, but maybe wanted to have an opportunity to take risks, experiment, explore new directions. I think Maya, that might be you, is, a, is an example of someone there. Um, uh, we'd always thought about caring and particularly women taking, uh, or female artists taking career breaks for say, for example, ma maternity reasons and child uh, care caring for children, but we'd never thought about um, artists who might be operating later on in life who need to have a career break, for example, to care for their elders. So that came up as well. We just hadn't anticipated that. And it was brilliant to be able to, to work with someone who's had that lived experience recently and uh, help them get back into their practice and work. We also had people who've retired or long term, term unemployed also um, physical health conditions, lots of different reasons that have forced essentially some kind of career break and and that that kickstart is, is needed a bit of a catalyzation and that's essentially what we felt that we could do that we haven't really realized before um, for this particular age group. Um, we, so as I said, lots of different impacts, lots of different learning. I think more recently, one of the things that we've been really thinking about is um, integration. And uh, Myra and I have been involved in a, a kind of um, an ongoing debate piece of research with the University of Sheffield, haven't we? And you raised this in one of the conversations with them about the positivity, the positive experiences from obstructions where we brought those two generations of artists together, the, the learning that happened in both directions, the friendships and the, the kind of social interaction that that occurred and whilst we know that there is a need to definitely continue to um, support a very targeted program I think as an organization what we're looking at at the moment and what we've learned is that we also need to look at how to for some individuals integrate uh, um, uh, across multi-generations as well within what we're doing um, and so we are being quite proactive in that. Maya's just um, found out that she's been successful applying to a new programme that we're rolling out called Sustain that has a big climate change focus and is um, set up to generate international exchange and connectivity with artists in Denmark. Um, but we also learn other things like 
about ourselves that we have something to give that we didn't realize that we did and that, that we could you know there were some anxieties on our part you know how can we look after various different access um concerns how would we support people who maybe needed some support around digital literacy for example and you know that's not our skill set we don't do that and then we realize actually no we, we do and we can and we've got those things to give as well um so that that's been fantastic that's built our confidence um and also it's yeah it's just generally made us understand that we've got more to offer than the, than we thought and that's that's the big impacts on our organization Thank you very much, Helen, and also thank you again to Maya. I think it's really it's really evident that this is a really complex uh, agenda we're looking at because we're looking at a whole ecosystem from how an organisation is set up to be age friendly. Now, are the seats comfortable? Is the lighting right? Is the print the right size? Is it on the right? Is it the right font on the right background? Uh, to actually, are we supporting artists who are older and really seeing them as artists as well as seeing them as older people? And are we giving them the right support? And are we also supporting the sector to 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 to, to encouraging them to do that and also to to take some risks and and it's been great working with Casper because they really have taken those risks and really stepped out of that kind of comfort zone and that thing they were really known for into a whole other arena of work and I think it's been really successful for everyone involved so thank you very much um, before we come to the last part of our session um, I just wanted to highlight the uh, website. Um, I put it in the chat, so it's greatplacegm.co.uk. Now this is a legacy website, and it has all the case that all the things we've been talking about today, and a lot more. They're in the process of being uploaded to the site. So for this particular theme, uh, we've got four main thematic areas. We've got creative health. Um, creative ageing, no one left out, which is around access and diversity, um, and also um, our place, which is about place shaping. Um, for each theme, we have uh, a number of case studies. And for this one, we have a case study around all the different culture champions projects and all the stuff we've been talking about today as well, and a few other things besides. And um, each, each thematic area has at least one film as well discussing the projects. And we'll be uploading um, recordings of these events as well, because there's lots of really interesting insights um, in there. Um, and there's one project that we won't be talking about today, which is really linked to, to everything we've been talking about. And that's an, uh, a kind of a Culture Champions Future Fires project. So just very briefly, I'll tell you just a couple of lines about it. So we also we started to think quite towards towards the end of Culture Champions that what we haven't really had space or opportunity to do is to develop um, develop people as producers uh, in their own right. So people who maybe hadn't had any experience. They're not professionals who wanted some professional development, but people who were older thought, actually, I could do that. Um, I could produce events in my community. So we took a model that was created for young people by Contact Theatre called Future Fires and we adapted it. Now, it, um, it, was, it was a small project without very much funding and Jackie, I think I spotted Jackie on the call today from, um, from ARC in Stockport. Um, they um, helped us project manage that and I think it wasn't, it wasn't an easy task. Um, but we took some people from across Greater Manchester, people could apply, and then we gave them a, a small budget and we gave them some training and we had to do that obviously online because of COVID and they created some really interesting, um, really amazing events and it's not the stuff that you would you would traditionally go oh yeah that was produced by an older person really diverse range of events um we'll be putting a case study about that up on our website soon but i think it really showed how the diverse when you create that space and put the resources in the hands of older people the diversity and the richness of the creative output and the opportunities to participate as well and to produce that um, older people can can um, just make for themselves. So or I should say ourselves because I'm I'm in that demographic now myself. So uh, OK, so we're going to talk about one last area of work now, and this is something which kind of goes outside of the culture sector, but really addressing that that idea of what how do we see older people? Um, so 
and, and how are they represented visually, culturally, um, in the media, by products, you know, by advertising. Um, I'm just going to share my screen very quickly while I just give a quick intro to this. So we worked with uh, we worked with Greater Manchester Older People's Network and we, uh, in fact, they approached, they approached me and said, well, we want to run a small photo photographic competition. Um, to cut a long story short, it became a big photographic competition. Uh, we put a call out to um, photographers from, um, from anywhere, really, to take photographs of subjects from Greater Manchester Older People and to really to start helping us to change the narrative from that no more wrinkly hands, everybody in sepia, um, needing help from younger people to actually, how can we represent the real lives of older people in Greater Manchester? What do older people actually look like? What do they do? So these, um, the images you can see on the screen, you can see them on the screen, can't you? Yeah, Helen's nodding, I can see Helen. Um, uh, these are our six win uh, winning images. Um, the winning image was taken by a professional photographer, but the other images, I think none of them, maybe one of them was, but most one or two were professional. Um, the, the the woman with the Tatton Park medal, that was a selfie that she took uh, that she took after she'd run the Tatton Park 10K. Um, we created a, a great bank of images, which now the Greater Manchester uh, Old People's Network has available to the not-for-profit sector to use uh, when they're advertising an event, when they're putting any kind of publicity out. There's a bank of images which they can use to, to illustrate them. So they're, they're different images. They're not the images that you're used to seeing. This is part of a whole national movement. There's all sorts of other projects popping up and some national projects as well, with, uh, for example, with the um, Centre for Aging Better. Um, one of the people that we worked with on this project was Steve Connor and um, from Creative Concern. And um, I'm going to hand over to um, Steve to, in a second, to tell you about it. Uh, tell you about the, how he was inspired by this project and where we're going with it next. Um, I'll just show you before that some images of what we did of what we did with these photographs as well. So during lockdown, the only at this point during lockdown, the only places that were open were supermarkets. So we ran a digital billboard campaign. Uh, we reached over 100,000 people and we, um, we showed the winning images um, on, these, on these billboards outside of um, Tesco stores across Greater Manchester. So there was one store in each of the 10 districts that we were able to work with. Um, it was a really positive campaign and it also got that message out at a time when older people were being talked about in some quite reprehensible ways in the press um, right at the beginning of the of the pandemic. So um, I just wanted to show you that image of what actually how powerful those images look like in situ. Um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now and I'm actually going to pass over to Steve Connor. So um, Steve's going to, as I said, talk a little bit about Adage, which is a project that we've been developing and really actually came from Steve as a response to, to the work that we've been doing. So Steve's the um, CEO of Creative Concern, which is a Manchester agency specialising in um, social issues and sustainability issues. So Steve, over to you. I will spotlight you now. Thank you, Julie. Am I, Julie, am I spotlighted? Brilliant. Um, so um, yeah, Julie. You, so basically, you got you got me thinking, um, and uh, and that was really exciting. So can you see my screen? Okay, Julie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, off the back of working with you, working with the centre, uh, the Creative Aging Development Agency, and others, I, I think for the first time in my career um, as a marketeer and advertising person. Um, I thought in some depth about the representation of older people in the media, advertising, marketing, and off the back of that, um, developed some thoughts that hopefully might lead to something that we launch in Greater Manchester, but that has a much bigger impact across the sector that I represent, which is marketing, advertising and, and design. So um, I'm just going to run through a little presentation, um, and it should only take a couple of minutes, but I uh, um, it, it's a really fascinating uh, bit of turf. I mean, uh, ageing, Paul, you started with this right at the beginning. Ageing is, in essence, the story of life itself. So there's a universality to all of this, 
which really ought to be better represented in the media. And currently, the media is doing a fairly awful job, really. Um, there are There's a whole string of debates in recent years about representation of older people, particularly in advertising. Um, here's one for a, a sort of um, a nutritional drink. This one caused some controversy um, in its extreme stereotypes of older people uh, advertising financial products. Um, but I, you know, the more I thought about this, the more I thought that marketing and media really does have a an issue around aging that needs to be addressed. Part of it is to do with the language that's used. It's extraordinary. I'll come back to visuals at the end, but language is used terribly. And there are all these sort of horrible phrases like sprightly or spry or feisty or sweet or frail um, that frame the representation of older people in a really quite uh, constraining and trapping sort of way. Um, and the more I looked into it, the more I realised that, that quite often we reference age when we don't even need to um, in, a, in a negative way. She's still working at 72, as if we should be surprised at that. Even at 74, Fred remains a King Gardener. So there are all these phrases where um, age becomes a reference point when it doesn't even need to be. Um, and the classic, of course, um, is even in their 60s, they still enjoyed a full and rewarding sex life. So there's these references to age um, that aren't necessarily helpful. Uh, and there's a bunch of crap metaphors that are used as well, which I can't bear. So it, and, and the more you start searching into all this stuff, the more you find it is kind of extraordinary autumn years, long in the tooth, old fogies. Uh, and one that I found in a lot of the marketing work that, that I started to look at, which is the disempowering habit of referring to older people as young, ironically. He was a youthful 76. Young at heart is a phrase that's used quite glibly. Um, uh, and again, is disempowering if you consider um, that ageing is, is part of life itself. Uh, and as Julie, as you, you just alluded to, even in um, during COVID, we've seen um, age used almost as a weapon. So um, there's sort of, you know, are, are older people somehow uh, a problem? Is there a, a major problem here? And there is, there's sort of like words like burden um, uh, are used extraordinarily glibly. Uh, the, the burden of an ageing society, the burden of pensioners. Um, and I found this in The Guardian, actually, very recently. Um, in The Guardian of all places. Can you imagine? Old people are a burden and will always be so, as long as there is any kind of welfare state. So, the, you know, this, this is live and this is culture and this is real. Um, and whether it's the age time bomb, uh, the framing of, of anybody who voted for Brexit, uh, as a sort of um, a, a, a sort of gnarly gammon selling out younger people. There's this kind of almost fake age-based culture war as well as a political one, which I think is really fascinating. It's one that uh, one project that we did with a bunch of European partners, ironically, given I've just been talking about Brexit, uh, around climate change, uh, where we created this campaign for COP21, um, not COP26, in seven European nations where we talked about we are the climate generation and actually starting to bridge the gap between different generations whether they have culpability, responsibility or expectations uh, around what we do to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and then I'm almost done, Julie, but the, the visual representation of older people uh, is very interesting and really does need unpacking. And in the old Frame New Picture project, there were some brilliant people looking uh, art and visual representation of older people. Um, but there was a very recent study done in the States where they looked at um, 1,400 ads or pieces of media. Um, and what was the representation of older people like? And it was really fascinating. It basically showed that for the portrayal of people over the age of 50, there was an overwhelmingly more negative representation of older people. So this is in the States, but it did cover some British ads as well. Um, and, and just fascinating stuff like how many ads of people over 50 showed technology versus those under 50? And it showed that, you know, basically older people aren't shown as much using technology, confident with technology, uh, even though obviously um, uh, older people can be. And this all serves to reinforce those negative tropes. Fascinating stuff when you go into the, the, the locations that people are depicted in. So if you're over 50, uh, you'll see right up the top of the screen there, you're much less likely to be de depicted in advertising as being in a working uh, environment, um, but you are more likely to be seen at home, very often depicted alone. Um, and there is a really interesting rhythm of visual representation where older people are seen uh, as being uh, alone or dependent. 
Uh, and fascinatingly, when it comes to marketing aspirational uh, images of wealth, again, the over 50s are much less likely to be depicted uh, than the under 50s. And then there's the, 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 the fascinating thing uh, uh, for me, just thinking about this more and more and thinking about our own practice at Creative Concern and, and whether we're guilty of this. Uh, and it's the actual invisibility of older people. Um, so even though people over 65 are a hugely important market, um, I think the spend of the over 50s in, in Greater Manchester is something like 3.5 billion. So it's a, a hugely important market. Uh, you find that even though, as you'd expect in Saga magazine, 62% of ads feature older people. Uh, if you flick through Men's Health magazine, it's less than 1%. So literally older people become invisible. Uh, and then finally, um, it's really interesting to find that some of this actually plays out in the marketing and media sector itself. Um, so one recent survey found that those who'd worked in marketing advertising for over 15 years or more, uh, I've been in it 20 years, um, had encountered ageism in one form or another. Um, and uh, in Britain, this is stats from the New York Times recently, um, in, in, in the United States, 81% um, of employees in the in the advertising, public relations, and marketing sectors are younger than 55, and and, and the situation's similar in Britain, um, where you know the average age of people in in our industry um, is just under 34. So that might be a part to play. So um, I, I've shared this with uh, Julie, Paul, colleagues before, but I wondered whether for for the creative and digital sector in Manchester, which is 15% of our economy, so it's really significant, um, whether we should launch a co. We could start some better practice here uh, and then spread it across the world. And so um, I figure uh, it should start in Manchester, not least because uh, Manchester is a place that where culture, creativity and older people come together. And I love this phrase. I think, Paul, you might mention it. Um, you know, somebody who bought Unknown Pleasures is 60 this year. So let's face it, we've got to grapple with this because this is a really significant uh, and important group of people who will not take kindly to being ignored. So I've suggested there might be a code, um, which is to proactively increase the positive visibility of older people. And I know I am now much more aware um, particularly in the photography used in our campaigns uh, of positively framing older people. Counter cliches and stereotypes, they're outdated. Look at some of that language that I was talking about earlier and just chuck it in the bin because it's totally, totally out of date, negative and rubbish. Um, forensically tackle language with those disempowering negatives, particularly those that kind of stoke some kind of culture war. Don't make age an issue if it doesn't need to be. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, and back in our own industry, tackle ageism itself. So if you're working in marketing, advertising and design, you know, realise that this is important as any other form of discrimination. So thank you very much for listening. And Julie, thanks so much for asking me to present. I, I really appreciated it. Um, thank you very much, Steve. I think you've generated quite a lot of comment and chatter in the uh, in the chat box there. Um, has anyone um, actually got any uh, questions or any comments they'd like to make? Somebody has asked if they could, if um, we could share the slides. I'll be in touch with all the presenters afterwards and I'll be sharing all, all the slides that I'm able to, uh, to share um, with you. Um, if you particularly want to, if you'd like to get in contact with me via the Eventbrite site or directly by email, um, I'll put my email in the chat in a second. Um, I will share um, as many any slides with me that um, with you that I'm allowed to. So I'll I'll put my I'll put something in the chat box in a second. Has anyone got any questions or any comments? And I think for for me that um, it's really interesting to hear how a creative project has created that response. Um, but also, I think there's a lot of learning from that response for the culture sector. So also how the culture sector advertises and how we market, uh, how we represent um, and what impact that that has on, on our audiences. Um, so it's really, really valuable and I'm hoping we can develop that work with Steve um, further. So um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Anybody, any of our speakers want to make any responses or any of our um, any of our audience want to want to ask a question of anyone or um, make a comment? Paul Burton, you would like to. Paul, I there you go. Paul, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Julie. Very interesting presentation from everybody. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that one. I was just going to ask Steve, really, uh, a question about whether things like the rise of, of, of Facebook, I think, you know, in Western society generally, we're, we're obsessed with notions of perfection. And I, I just wondered to what extent you felt social media perhaps uh, led to an increase in the sort of uh, obsession with perfection as a means of selling things. And because older faces perhaps, you know, don't always embody that perfection, even though I think, you know, that's a, a ridiculous stereotype because there's many different types of face and, and it's, it's just a nonsense, the idea that there's only one vision of beauty, et cetera, et cetera. I just wonder if that has actually embedded it in the system, the rise of social media, things like Instagram and so on, and, and whether that's actually made the problem a heck of a lot worse than it might have been had we not had those medias. Uh, thanks, Paul. Actually, I think being on Teams and Zoom and having to look at your own face for two years is probably <laughs> doing much more damage than Facebook. I just I think bloody hell, Steve, you look knackered. Um, but um, no, I think I actually um, advertising as an industry and the representation of um, perfection, as you put it quite rightly, Paul, is quite old and it's always been thus. And I, I wouldn't blame social media. I think, you know, there are, there are ways in which um, TikTok, Instagram, uh, whichever one you, you sort of turn to can amplify negativity. But it's as old as humankind itself, if I'm really honest, Paul, and I wouldn't lay the blame at uh, Facebook's door or Instagram's door or Twitter's door. Um, we use these media and uh, and we play out our tropes with them, but it goes back as uh, as long as you want to go. Thanks, Steve. OK, thank you. Anything, any other final thoughts um, or I'll just do a uh, Paul, go on. Yeah, just uh, just a kind of a, 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 an antidote, maybe to the um, to the way that the that, that older people are portrayed. My favourite, I mean, we've been involved in various kind of positive image programmes around ageing over a long time. And uh, my favourite one is is by, uh, it's called Wrinkles of the City, uh, which is a, a French artist called JR. And he works in, uh, he's worked in Berlin and uh, Tokyo and Havana and LA and so on. And he works with groups of older people and uh, talks to them about their stories and then uh, produces these amazing artworks that are on the sides of buildings, you know, the, si the size of the side of a block of flats. Uh, and there's a website with all this stuff on. And, you know, if somebody got, if somebody had the wherewithal or the, or the access to do something like that, I think would be enormously brilliant for, for Greater Manchester because in the past when we've done city side ad advertising programmes or uh, uh, advertising sites around older people, doing that work has made more impact on public agencies about how they think about ageing than a thousand reports that I've written, to be honest. You know, one image in the city centre. Uh, and there are a few scattered around the northern quarter actually, but one big image in the city, so a number of them can really change things. So just a thought for anybody who's uh, wrinkles of the city, I'll try and get the link for it and put it in. OK, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, we're kind of coming to the end of the session now. So you get two minutes for comfort break before your next team's meeting. Some of you at two o'clock probably. Um, Obviously, we now have the um, Creative Ageing Development Agency, which is a national organisation, which as part of Great Place, we were able to fund some of the development that led to the um, to bringing CADA to, to Greater Manchester. Uh, Virginia Tandy is the director um, of, of CADA and they're based at uh, Manchester Museum. And some of the work, some of the thinking and the ideas um, that we've been talking about today are being fed into that national work. Um, something that we're going to be looking at in Greater Manchester is, is that the, the economics around um, ageing and inclusion in the cultural sector. Um, we were hoping, hoping to carry on working with Helen on Boulder and, and developing older artists and obviously with Steve on the um, adage, uh, on the adage um, agenda. So um, please stay in touch. Um, this work um, doesn't stop here. It's um, some of it was was developing projects and, and ideas that were already happening and, and, and out there and some of this has been new work. Um, we have another session 
uh, in two, just under two weeks time, um, no one left out. And at that session, we'll be talking, one of the projects we'll be talking about is Back in the Closet. I mentioned it before. So that work with housing associations and LGBTQ visibility um, in, in extra care schemes. But um, for now, um, I'd like to say thank you so much to all of our speakers and also thank you very, very much for um, everyone who's come along to listen and participate in, in today's session. So um, thank you very much and um, have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>